Kuzo Zambo and welcome to the 56th session of Bhutan Dialogues. My name is Lobzong Jirmi and our topic for the 56th session is burnout and mental well-being of Bhutanese employees. Bhutan is known for prioritizing the happiness and well-being of its citizens above economic growth. The country's unique approach to development, known as Gross National Happiness, GNH, aims to promote the holistic comfort of individuals and society at large. Mental health is an essential aspect of overall happiness, and it is becoming increasingly recognized as an important area of focus for employers in Bhutan. The Bhutanese government and concerned agency have taken numerous steps to promote mental health and security in the workstation. For instance, the Bhutan's Labor and Employment Act of 2007 mandates that employers provide employees with a safe and healthy work environment. Additionally, the Royal Civil Service Commission has implemented various initiatives to promote mental health and well being in the workplace. The initiatives include stress management training, mindfulness workshops, open communication, empathy, self care, and establishment of employee assistance programs. Despite these efforts, mental health issues are still prevalent in Bhutan. Factors such as work related stress, financial pressures, and social stigma can all contribute to mental health problems among employees. As the country continues to grow and evolve, it will be crucial to maintain this focus on holistic well being and ensure that mental health is given the attention and support it deserves. To start off with the conversation, allow me the pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. We have Dr. Dambar Kumar Nirola, who is a consultant psychiatrist with over 32 years of experience in various hospitals in Bhutan. He was the head of Department of Psychiatry and has served as a technical advisor to the Mental Health Program at Minister of Health. He is also a member of Executive Board for Bhutan Medical and Health Council, as well as a board member of Bhutan Board for Certified Counselors. Doctor has also served as a chairman of the Professional Ethics and Reg Registration Committees of Bhutan Medical and Health Council and the Medical Board of Doctors for the Minister of Health. Next, we have lecturer Yishi Lamu. She is a junior lecturer at Jimmy Singh Yuanchu School of Law, specializing in family law and drought law. Yishi graduated in 2018 from Christ University, Bangalore, India, majoring in Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Law with a postgraduate diploma in National Legal Studies from Royal Institute of Management in 2019. She completed her master's in children's rights and family law at University College Cork, Cork Island in 2022. With her passion for children's rights and mental health, she has done programs on gender justice through Hear My Voice, a women's network. Um, our host is Mr. Ngawang Gilson. He is the founder and CEO of Bhutan Food, Wan Yong, World Peace Ambassador, European Development Day's Young Leader 2022, and he serves as one of Lodin's Board of Trustees. Before we start the conversation, here are some house rules. There will be a question and answer session afterwards. And I would like to request that questions to the speaker be kept short and to the point in the interest of allowing time for more questions and for in-depth responses, rendering the Q&A session a meaningful exchange. Our viewers may drop their questions in the chat box. The Bhutan Dialogues team will compile the questions and read them out during the Q&A session. Thank you and touch delay. The floor is yours, Mr. Ngo. Thank you, Lok. Last, thank you, Lobzang. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome our online viewers to the 56th session of Bhutan Dialogues. Bhutan Dialogues is an initiative of the Loden Foundation. Uh, it is a space for critical and civil conversation with thought leaders and change makers, drawing upon their expertise, achievements, and inspiration. It aims to invigorate development thinking and refine our ideas and the pursuit of human progress. It is a forum for right speech and mindful listening. Globally today, burnout seems to be on a rise. More and more people are feeling emotionally exhausted and cynical as a result of chronic and acute work-related stress. 
but many people are in the same boat and don't get burned out. In today's session, we make an attempt to understand work-related stress, its effect on our mental well-being, and in doing so, hopefully find some solutions that address this very critical problem. Before we begin, a uh, small disclaimer, the opinions expressed here today are of their uh, of, of their own by the speakers here are their own and not of the of their respective organizations now now with that uh just to break the ice uh, first of all uh welcome dr nirola and uh miss Ishe. uh just to break the ice the first question question that i wanted to ask both of you and you can take turns answering is why are you passionate about mental health perhaps we can begin with uh Yishela. Oh, doctor, yes, please go ahead. No, I'll, I'll request Yishe to ask that because uh, I'm anyway a mental health professional, so I <laughs> must be passionate anyway. <laughs> so, yes, Yishe, can okay, you please go Yishe, ahead? Um, okay, well, so I would like to say that mental health is something a lot of people kind of ignore in this time and age because... Um, especially in this, uh, especially in Bhutan, we kind of view mental health as something that we can overlook, not necessarily overlook, something that we can go ahead with. It's something like, oh, everyone has it, we can do it, you know, it, it's ignored. So for me, especially since I deal with family and children law, I see a lot of people who come to me with issues such as, oh, I, ha I, I had a bad day, but then I had to come home, I had to take over something, I had to fight with my, my spouse, I had to show my anger to my boss, you know, I couldn't show it in front of him, so I go back home. And people view mental health only just because of work stress, but that's not only the issue. Uh, I also believe that when you have mental health, it's not just something that people cannot see. So mental health in that way is like, oh, no one has that problem. No one's suffering from depression. No one has anxiety. So in that sense, I feel like um, the main important aspect for me as to why I believe in mental health is that everyone should have access to it. Uh, not, just, uh, not just professionals, not just children, not anyone, but anyone in the profession who's going through something need to have some sort of uh, guidance. And I believe that mental health is an important aspect for one to live a proper life. Lasla and doctor, perhaps, I mean, uh, we, I mean, okay. as a profession, yes, la, uh, yeah. as a psychiatrist, I, you have to be passionate about mental health and that's why you're here. But uh, just so that our audience can understand, you know, what, what uh, why did you choose this profession to begin with? Perhaps if you could shed some light on that. Sure, sure. See, until uh, from 1989 until 2002, I was a general medical doctor working in various hospitals. And then I came across quite a lot of people with mental health issues. And in the meantime, uh, there was also a need for a psychiatrist, uh, a, a doctor to go for psychiatry tra training. So, uh, Fortunately, I got the opportunity. I went, got myself trained, and I, I started working as a psychiatrist. Now, over the period, what I have noticed is the satisfaction uh, about my own profession. Like when people come with depression, with many other mental problems, and when I'm able to address their uh, need, when I'm able to give them the ear to listen to without being judgmental, and when they come back and give me the feedback that uh, it has helped them. So it has, it has been a great motivating factor. So uh, I'm really passionate about uh, mental health simply because I think not many people would like to join this profession. Many people think that becoming a psychiatrist is something uh, not very important or it's not a real doctory job that you want to cut or you want to do so many other things. So I have stuck to this profession and I'm very passionate and I want to continue to serve until I can stand on my feet. In fact, uh, if, you, if I have to share uh, something uh, uh, about my thing, like over the last uh, couple of years, I have been approached uh, for even political uh, work. I mean, people wanted me to join politics, but I, I actually declined very gently saying that, we need mental health profession, professionals to take care of our people here. And uh, we don't want to deplete the 
very small men like human resource pool that we have in mental health so that is the reason why i want mental health to be my passion throughout my life let's talk to uh thank you uh so driving right into the topic right uh, of today uh we want uh, to understand how serious is workplace stress in bhutan ba? so if you could elaborate on you know how many cases for example do you receive in a day or in a month that are specifically related to burnout or workplace stress la? and if you could elaborate on that <clears throat> okay now uh the exact figure it will be very difficult for me to share but i Plus. think it is it is becoming more common now uh, more so after the pandemic uh, happened and uh, after the pan after the, the pandemic a lot of people left for australia and many civil servants are now uh, going out quitting the job and all that thing so what has happened is uh, the uh, the remaining civil servants are facing a lot of stress because they are not able to get a substitute for the person who has left for uh, australia or for other uh, brighter futures so that is creating a lot of stress among people so i do see if i if i really have to uh, say a specific figure perhaps i see about four to five people coming help coming for help uh, in order yes. to manage their stress so they they come with various things such as uh, mostly anxiety related symptoms some people have become depressed as well some people really break down mentally and they they can become uh, even uh, manic sort of thing so we are seeing this uh, burnout now work stress actually um, can be faced by many professionals it is not like uh, only to the civil service for example now if you look at the uh, look at the private sector for example uh, the yes. way you get paid uh, is uh, actually very nominal and then many people find it difficult to meet their ends because they are living in thimpu where uh, almost everything is now very expensive including your house rent you, your day to day expenditures your bills and all that thing and on top of that there are also reasons why uh, why people might get stressed uh, because sometimes people are unable to divide their time or uh, segregate their time from work and the family so all these things okay, are happening okay doctor thank you so so uh, that uh so but what about let's say pre covid right because you mentioned that after, uh, you know due to the pandemic uh uh, uh you have you're seeing a rise in you know uh, patients uh people with uh work related stress but uh, was it simi- was it similar before the pandemic or is it a post covid 19 uh pandemic uh, phenomena okay uh now if i have to look at the pre covid era uh, what was happening was actually we saw quite a lot of uh, especially the uh, teachers uh, group where they were posted in the remote areas uh, where they had to live separately from their family and all that thing that was creating a lot of a uh, lot of issues uh, but uh, if you look at the number of uh, cases now in comparison to in the past now we get varied people in, in fact we get people from uh the even corporate sectors now bank banks and um, other organizations who actually are paid much more but then uh, the replacement hasn't happened and people are uh, basically handling a lot more job than they used to so i think that's the reason why the increase has happened over the period i see doctor i see la. so uh coming to you ishe uh, as a young professional yourself uh, how important do you think mental well-being is in the workplace and you know how does it affect for example the people in the immediate surrounding uh, you know like for example families your your immediate family if you could uh, share some thoughts on that um, um that's, uh, so for me i think the most important thing is um first and foremost uh, as you know the payment foundation which her majesty the queen has initiated has always said that mental health is a really important part of the nation right now and it deserves attention that it needs 
And for me, I think as a young professional, which I've joined in my institution for the past three years, I've actually had a good time. So I, I can't say much on that. But I think um, what a lot of other people are going through is the fact that they are overwhelmed with a huge amount of work, which actually could have been spread out to two, two to three other people. But it was not possible because we are on shortage of resources, especially in terms of uh, not having enough people to do the same type of job. And what happens when you have that sort of situation is if it if it's a spouse, usually it's spouses if they're together, it's kind of okay because they can start talking. You know, they can they can have a conversation about what how it was work. And they they discuss about it. But most of the time, that is not the situation. Sometimes couples are. Are separated <laughs> they don't work in the same organization or specifically they don't work at the same place one is in paro see the another one in Tashigang, and it affects their work life the children's attention is gone the children are not getting the needs they need family is stressed out then what happens is they end up looking for attention elsewhere which ends up leading to divorce which ends up leading to a lot of arguments um, a lot of issues which are never discussed before then comes forth um, your anger your ego everything comes in between in that sense so for me especially i feel like your immediate near and dear ones your friends maybe then some of them start saying like oh you never come meet me sometimes they're like oh no i have had work you know i had to stay over you know i have to work late sometimes but some of your friends will be like you never come and hang out and then you kind of lose touch with that then you lose the immediate friends because you cannot go for family gathering and issues like that. And then these comes out. So I feel like mental yes. well-being, when people talk about it, they kind of exclude that side. They don't think of the people around you because um, it just affects you. And then they're like, oh, if you overwork, you know, you can do something about it. Go for a meditation or go for a walk. <laughs> Usually it doesn't happen because your friends and family are affected at the end of the day. And especially if you have a family, um, the child needs the attention at that age. If they are young, below the age of 18, are their most prime age where they need the attention. And according to our Child Care and Protection Act of Bhutan, that says that the best interest of the child is always, uh, is meant to be the priority or the principle. If parents are not happy and if their mental well-being is not protected by the government or by the institution, then where are the child rights? Where are the family rights then? So I guess in that way, mental well-being in that sense is really, really important. Last issue, you mentioned a very important point, which is about legislation around mental health, right? Because I guess that speaks volumes about people's understanding about how important mental health is. And I, uh, I, have, uh, I think we can touch, uh, we can uh, dig deeper into that uh, uh, in, in uh, our follow-up conversations. But doctor, uh, going back to the COVID-19 pandemic, I was just reading a statistic uh, you know, a uh, preparing for our session today, and it was very alarming. So, for example, in the United States of America, for example, almost half of the workforce reported feeling burned out as a result of pandemic related factors such as remote work, long hours, fear of unsafe working conditions, and concerns about job security, for example. So, uh, does that mean that? Uh, after COVID-19 pandemic, one of the, uh, how do you think have we responded towards mental health or has there been any change the way we look at mental health, uh, more specifically the way we look at uh, work, work uh, stress in the workplace? Has there been a change in, I don't know, in your profession as well, the way you look at it? Mm, well, I think during the pandemic, obviously, there were issues. There were people who had to uh, work from home. And sometimes when you're working from home, uh, you are also uh, uh, distracted by all other chores that you have to attend to. Uh, sometimes that can be distraction because you have a family member who is too small. Or there may be infants at home. There may be old people at home. All that thing could have happened. Now, uh, uh, we did see a rise in cases uh, of uh, anxiety mostly and uh, uh, other other things related to boredom and being uh, just locked inside the house and all that thing not being able to go out meet their relatives because we are we are a very gregarious society we, we like to go out have party we have to go for picnics and all that and when we are restricted to do that and you didn't know what to what to what to expect or what how to pass time people did have that problem but yes. uh, following the pandemic obviously I, I have already mentioned that a lot of people have already lost their jobs now especially if you look at the uh, the tourism sector 
uh, like uh, after the new new policies came in place, I think a lot of people got displaced. They still tell me that they they didn't get a job after that. Like tour tour guides have not been all the tour guides who got trained are not uh, employed yet. There were people who couldn't sustain here because uh, I think uh, people were not able to pay. And again, we saw this uh, migration that is happening for uh, Australia to Middle East and other places. So that is also actually bringing down the business of the people. So that really uh, sort of gives a lot of stress on people. Now, many people had to shut down their business simply because it was not uh, running. And then yes. recently, I even heard uh, that some of the houses are now remaining vacant. So people who built houses are now having difficulty finding a tenant, or if they, even if they find tenants, probably they cannot expect to get more from them so, so that they have to pay their uh, loans and things like that. So I, I, I feel people are stressed about all these things. And then, as I mentioned earlier, I think now uh, one person handling two, three people's job is a, also a, another issue that uh, is coming up. Now, in our, in our own profession, now we see a uh, few people living, uh, not many, it's not a very drastic thing, but yet uh, sometimes very uh, specialized uh, uh, doctors, if they leave the country, then that act actually uh, is uh, like, quite difficult for the, for the patients like in order to just provide that service sometimes they have to be uh, do they have to be referred out for a very simple reason because we don't have that category of specialist here uh, which means Plus. the government will incur more expenditure on sending them outside you know? so all these things are i think uh, affecting us now yes doctor uh, i think you mentioned two very important points here First one was, for example, the nature of Putinese families, right? The fact that you right. know, we have uh, extended families and uh, and I particularly uh, want to ask you about the effect of, for example, having elderly parents, right? I mean, we have yeah. a, we say we have a young demographic, right? But at the same time, the young demographic has a lot of cultural responsibilities with their elders, more specifically their parents. So I think that is, in many ways, a hidden, unforeseen, you know, element to the mental well-being of a young professional, for example. So, if you could elaborate a little more on that, like uh, on how that might be affecting uh, our mental well-being. Okay. Now, let's give an example of one individual who has a very yes. old person at home. Maybe this old person, the old parent, was living in a village. And Plus. has been brought here, has been brought to the to the city now because you want to take care of them. But then Plus. you have a you have a family which is like uh, working outside. Uh, let's say uh, the both husband and wife they go out for work, and you leave your old parent inside our uh, apartment. Now our the older generation uh, prior to our generation. Uh, was not used to living in these type of apartments because uh, they had a vibrant community where they used to go from one house to another. They knew each other. So they had that sense of belongingness in the village. Yes. And then now suddenly you are put here and there's nobody to talk to. The next door neighbor is never known to me. Who, all that thing happens. And then probably they might put you put you in front of a television which talks some nonsense language we, which you may not even uh, understand okay so this is this is actually uh, not only affecting i mean no body would like to leave their parents in that manner but the problem is there's no options so when you yes. don't have the options you are also concerned you are also concerned yes. even while you are working at the office, you might suddenly feel that, oh, uh, what could have happened to them? What may be going on? Is there everything all right? So you are constantly worried about the well-being of that individual that you have locked inside the house. So that's a, that's a big challenge. Now, yes. uh, unfortunately, like in many uh, welfare countries where 
uh, people who take care of their elderly or a disabled child or somebody mentally challenged person uh, to take care. Actually, there is a compensation paid to, to those people so that they don't have to go and work full time so that they can take care of that thing, which we can't afford. I think our government cannot afford. We know that. So that's, that's a problem. Now, the other thing that I have seen is the less, uh, less say, uh, even when the old people are uh, back home in their own village. Now, what has not happened is, in spite of the fact that they have crossed the age of 65 or the retirement age, they are not actually retired. Like in civil service or any other government organization, we just retire at certain age, you are given a pension, you are sitting here, You at least that little pension, whatever you get, might be able to uh, able to sustain to some extent. But the old people back home have to keep on doing the same old chores that they had been doing because all their uh, children have now migrated. They are all employed elsewhere. They are not coming home or even if they come home, they just come once in a, once in a year, uh, ha stay for a couple yes. of weeks and then just go away. So that is also creating a problem. Because see, these yes. rural people not only have to take care of their own needs, they all also have to listen to Chokpa, Mangmi, Gap, all that thing. They have to contribute in labor, yes. labor thing. All these things, no, I, sometimes I feel really uh, sorry for these people. I empathize with them, but then uh, there seem to be no alternative. Less doctor. So uh, I, I thank you for elaborating uh, about the differences of uh, uh, you know, work-related stress in in a urban setting and a rural setting, and you mentioned something very interesting about the human resource that we have right now. And I would like to get back to you on this. But since we're discussing about taking care of elderly parents and how that might be taking a toll on the mental well-being of professionals, uh, Yishe, you mentioned that you know in uh, in your in your bio it was said, and of course you it you stressed upon it as well. About how passionately you feel about children's rights, uh, you know we have to take care of our children as well. So, uh, what is the status like in Bhutan right now in terms of legislation uh, as to you know what are the rules and regulations? What are, so, for example, practices around getting maternity leave? How easy it is to raise a child in Bhutan, right? And and uh, whether is it for whether it is contributing towards positive mental well-being or is it uh, in the, indirectly becoming, uh, you know, uh, inhibitor or indirectly contributing to work-related stress. Now, if you could elaborate on that. Uh, that's okay. Um, as far as um, to the best of my knowledge, of course, is that the government is looking yes. into the best mental well-being of all employees. Um, especially as I mentioned, the PMS Center, the initiated by Her Royal Highness, um, Her Majesty the Queen, is how mental health is such an important aspect i think uh, with the times have changed since uh, maybe 10 years ago mental health was never seen as such a top priority but now i believe people are seeing as dr nirola also mentioned how important mental health is not just by one yourself and something i mentioned again that uh, in, uh, as i spoke previously is how important it is at home um children's yes. right as i mentioned is that um, a lot of people assume that children if you give them education if you give them a home a roof over their house and, and if you give them food on time means you know they're well and taken care of but that's not necessarily an issue when it comes to rights and children i believe the environment they're grown up is very very important that's why i say that um if a parent who is stressed at work who is overbooked overworked so much to an extent that when he comes home he's tired and can't Take care of his children have a can't even have a normal conversation because he's exhausted from work next morning again he doesn't even have breakfast with his kids he just goes home he just goes to work the mother at the same time if she's a working woman will do the same thing at the end of the day the child will not get the needs it needs the motherly affection the fatherly love maybe going out in a while going for walks together even those minimal things that we take for granted mm -hmm. are taken away when the person has been exhausted oh, <laughs> and, um, uh, yes, no. so yes, you continue. Uh, sorry, for that. sorry, sorry, it's okay. Uh, and I was saying is that also what we have to understand right now is that, um, even uh, we don't have proper legislative as far as I know. Uh, we can, as you mentioned at the beginning, the Labor Act has, of course, RTS has taken measures, but. Um, even the Prisons Act of 1907, I'm sorry, the 2009, where we have uh, the Section 132, which talks about the conjugal rights for legally married prisoners to meet once a month. 
So in the Prisons Act, yes. it says that if a, if a legally married couple uh, wants to ha- wants to have conjugal rights, they can come once a month. Even those are taken care of because um, parents can visit free people even in prison. Those are things we take for granted because um, when you start working, you don't think about family in general because you just want to work, work, work. Make sure you do the best you can. Make, maybe try to uh, get a better position and <laughs> try to you yeah. know, save as much as you can because you want to you wanna save some time before you be able to earn a little bit and then maybe use that, for, uh, use that in the future. But what a lot of people forget is that um, families are, uh, the mental health begins at home. Uh, when it is at home, we forget that when you go to work, you bring your stress back home. You, you don't leave it there. And it's very difficult as human beings to separate between work and personal life sometimes. And we tend to forget that. And in that event, I really think that one needs to look into how to be able to talk to your friends um, if, because Bhutan lacks the need to have proper psychologists and psychiatrists where you can go and talk about your burnout, maybe talk about how you're feeling mentally. These might be one of the access that we can have where the government can maybe yes. look into and then then help any profession who wants to go and just talk about how they feel. Yes. So effectively, what I'm understanding from you, Ishi, here is that we uh, we have isolated you know policies and practices, but we do not have an overarching mental health mental health legislation, right? Am, am I understanding uh, no, correctly yeah. now? Less. Yes, yes. So, um, so yes. I just want to say, so when people think of mental health, uh, there are two laws when you look into the first mental health law that we, when people ask, oh, do we have a mental health law in Bhutan is that first we think about is the fact that mental health does not necessarily mean uh, the person who is, uh, you know, mentally exhausted or has uh, people look into some sort of thing that mentally incapable people who can't make decisions. Those are the first type of laws that we have. Um, then second law that we that we are talking about today is the mental health, to, the right to be happy, the right to turn off your phones after 5 p.m. when you get back home, the right to enjoy your weekends without disturbing, without worrying about your boss calling on the Saturday and saying, hey, can you come into work? Because even if you, then that works out. But in that sense, we don't have proper source of mental health law. There are policies, but they are all standalones and uh, instituted by the institutions. So uh, given that there is obviously a, a, a conversation around it, but at the same time, no such overarching legislation, I I'm, I wanted to ask, and this question is for both the panelists, uh, Doctor, for you as well. Uh, do you think that uh, there exists a stigma around understanding, uh, uh, around mental mental health? And we're talking about something very specific uh, you know, uh, in the b- very broad theme of mental health, which is work-related stress. But do you think that because there is no uh, proper understanding of mental health to begin with, that, uh, you know, a very small L- uh, part of that, which is uh, work-related stress, uh, is not recognized? Right? So do you think there is a stigma around that, uh, around mental health in general? Uh there is definitely a big stigma and i think yes. that is that is a big challenge and in fact it is the duty of every one of us to try and uh, help with this basically we have to dispel the stigma we have to somehow educate the people that seeking help for any type of mental health issue is not like it should not be stigmatized now, yes. just to, today only, I came across one lady who came to me for the first time, and she was mentioning about, like, uh, somebody met her on the way, and she said, oh, are you going to the psychiatric OPD? That is a place for mad people. Are you mad? Or are you psycho? That sort of a thing, you know? And then she, she was a little concerned. Now, why did another doctor refer to me if it is just if I'm not a psycho then why why am I supposed to go and see Dr. Nirola for example and she came to me I had a talk with her I found out that she had some symptoms of panic attack so I wanted to help her and then suddenly she again told me like if you if you take psycho medicine you'll have to take it for life and then it will make you uh, very fat you will look like a tuntun you know, long ago, there used to be a, a actor in Hindi film called Tuntun, a very fat lady uh, who used to be quite amusing lady. So that's 
the 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 older generation still call tun tun if you, if you are slightly on the bulkier side so you will become like tun tun that that was the exact word she she told me then i had to explain to her why she was here why was she experiencing all these palpitations uh, the occasional shortness of breath and all and then i reassured her that the medicines are not going to be uh, addicting i also told her that they are not going to make her uh, heavy or obese and then uh, i don't know whether she is going to take the medicine or not but at least she decided to take take the prescription and she went away from my, from my chamber now this is one thing the other thing that i have noticed it like especially uh, among the slightly illiterate group people don't have the hassle of coming and seeing a psychiatrist but the problem sure. is with the educated lot and then the other thing that i have come across is people want a reason for somebody to be either depressed or have a mental health issue so they think that if you have every material uh, things that you require you should not be depressed or you should not have any type of worry or anything so we do try and educate people we go to the television quite frequently we come on online even in uh facebook and we try to educate people but in spite of this uh, the stigma is so strong that uh, sometimes we have difficulty so we are not able to actually fill in the gap between people who require services and the services that we actually provide but in spite of that now we are seeing greater number of people coming and seeking help in comparison to the past so Uh, we are not like uh, without any job as such in fact i see about 30 to 40 patients in a day which is virtually tiring and uh, uh, quite a challenge for me as a mental health professionals because we don't have uh, so many people that uh, we we can sort of hire and uh, use them yes. so that's a big big challenge la plus doctor thank you la uh you mentioned two very critical points earlier which i wanted to touch on which is the human resource capabilities i just want to know uh, how many psychiatrists like yourself are there in the country and uh, you know i'm pretty sure that we, we we don't have enough so if you could try to highlight the statistics for for our viewers that uh, well, what is the current situation like la okay uh, now when it comes to psychiatrist uh we are five in number and out of that four of us are here in jdw but among yes. the from among the four one is undergoing a fellowship training in australia so we are only three uh we yes. are training two two more people in the university to uh, who might graduate in another one or two years two people are undergoing training outside yes. so currently the psychiatrists are just five in total and one is a military doctor so who Plus. provides sometimes even general duty and all and even uh, the army uh, personnel sometimes have to be referred to us in order to get the services uh, so effectively there are just four of us uh, who are <laughs> actively working and when it and comes to more? clinic yeah at jdw that's only at jdw Plus. now Plus. we don't have any any psychiatrist in the regional referral hospitals nor in that districts uh now yes. when it comes to psychologist the clinical psychologist we have just once in gelefu uh, who is also yes. a nurse who, who got trained as a as a psychologist uh so she she's there uh and then beyond that we don't have any clinical psychologist in jdw we don't have uh, any uh, psychiatric social workers Uh, recently we have a fair number of uh, clinical counselors we have we are training more and more clinical counselors so that we can send them to each and every uh, district hospital so that they can actually act, at least uh, provide basic services out there so yes. uh, human resources we still lack and we need to produce more so i don't know when that is going yes. to happen but hopefully it will it will happen in one day Let's thank thank you for clarifying that, uh, doctor. Because I think that's a very important aspect of addressing the issue, right? And you cannot uh, 
have sure. people who are supposed to address mental health most, and then also work related stress be under work related stress at the same time um there is this i'm sure both the speakers are aware of this recent phenomena of you know uh what's what's been called quite quitting so that's basic so for for our viewers who have uh, uh have are hearing it for the first time it's when an employee uh decides to not do anything more than what they are supposed to do to prevent and in most cases it's to prevent burnout but it's just to do the absolute bare minimum in their profession and you know and this is mostly in response to uh, an acute chronic uh, work related stress right so and uh, i think it's mostly been reported among young people and uh, and it's, although it's been yeah, there's been a lot of coverage in news very recently i personally don't think it's a recent phenomenon but as a young young person uh, Yishe, uh, what do you think about this phenomenon of quite quitting and do you think it's happening in bhutan for example um so i've heard quite quitting of course i think it's not just a recent phenomenon people have had it before but i were unaware that it was happening um i believe that one of the main reasons quite quitting happening is of course peer pressure not just work pressure but peer pressure um if you look at it from perspective one of your friend or close friends in your workplace is going to australia or is going to canada and then one person leaves another person leaves in the office you come back home and you're like okay why am i still here and then you feel like okay do i really want to be here now if everyone goes in that sense i feel like quite quitting is also prominent in that sense but um this phenomena i although it has been trending now in 2023 it has always been there in the past couple of years people were not aware of it and i feel like quite quitting is one in situation where if you're over you're burnt out your too much work is in your plate um you're not getting the social life that you need is when they feel the need where they have really aware, especially the younger generation are very aware of mental health. So they feel like, but, is this worth dying over? Is this worth, is, 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 do I really want to work in the place where I'm going to be, um, where I'm going to work for the rest of my life? Am I, do I want to be in this place? So a lot of quit quitting happens then, I feel like, uh, where you're like, okay, I'm going to look for better options outside, you know, not necessarily in Tipu, but I'm going to go look in power and see how I like there. So it's not just a recent phenomenon, and I feel like it's just not the younger generation. A lot of um, the older generation as well as anyone who's worked for quite some time, who's aware of what's happening, they've come to accept that mental health is far more important than their physical health. Because um, when you work in one place for too long, you don't get benefits. You're not, um, if you work for quite a long time, you, you don't get the benefits you need. Um, you kind of realize that, you know, at the end of the day, my mental health is far more important. So I think quite good thing then comes into action and they're like, you know what, I'm going to quit it here. I can find a better job outside with my qualifications. So I guess that's one way to look at it. Les, thank you. Love. But, uh, oh, doctor, do, do you uh, have any opinion on that, love, on the phenomenon of quite quitting? Uh, well, I think Yishe has explained it uh, nicely, and I don't want to repeat everything. I think uh, this is a phenomenon that we see. Uh, now we are seeing quite a lot, huh? uh, frankly yes, speaking. Uh, many people well, are like sitting on the edge. <laughs> less, less doctor, so I mean, uh, you you mentioned before before you you just you mentioned something very interesting about uh, you know the statistics around uh, uh, around number of uh, uh, psychiatrists that we have, but at the same time, uh, um, you know, is there a possibility of for us to leverage, you know, uh, our uh, our tradition and uh, you know uh, traditional human resource such as lums and tips, you know, and uh, all all these uh, practices, cultural practices, also to uh, you know uh, to uh, uh, to address. Uh, the, uh, the acute shortage that you just mentioned in terms of the resource persons. Uh, is there a way we can uh, use that to uh, address uh, mental health challenges in our community? Is, is, that, is, is, there, uh, is there an angle to that? Uh, well, if you look at the history of uh, psychiatric services in Bhutan, like uh, yes. 25 years ago, when we didn't have any psychiatrists, people could have still had uh, mental problem, but yet they somehow managed uh, because uh, I think uh, mm, our uh, religious beliefs, our spiritual practices, our shaman system, our traditional healers, pro probably 
they were providing some form of uh, treatment. Of course, yes. over the period, we have seen that some became an obstacle to the modern science. Uh, they were, yes. in fact, uh, giving wrong advices uh, so that people didn't seek help. Uh, but now, over the period of time, we do see a lot of collaboration happening, and especially the, the, the modern educated lums and all are sort of motivating people to seek help, uh, like instead of uh, doing too many rimdos and things like that. So uh, things are being complemented, but I'm, I'm sure we should not be totally taken over by them because some, some people don't necessarily get all right without taking medications. So medications have to be prescribed as well. But when, it's, when it comes to spiritual practices and all, I think they can always lean upon uh, our own religious beliefs, whichever system it is, like uh, people have different religions and faith and other things. Some people may not even <clears throat> believe. So I think we must continue. Now, what we have done recently is we have actually in our psychiatric ward, we have also incorporated the traditional uh, traditional medical system, the traditional medicine uh, people, the Dungsos and Menpas are housed inside our ward so that they can also provide therapy in the form of you know, all that. Uh, they, they use uh, some uh, medicinal oil for massage, body, uh, this thing, serkhap, uh, acupuncture, meditation, and things like that. So. Uh, we are trying to incorporate all these things because we don't want uh, want to segregate modern modern uh, medicine vis-a-vis -vis our own traditional system. So uh, both have to complement, and people do benefit if we combine together. Uh, yeah, uh, th thank you, Doctor, for for reason, uh, uh, highlighting on this point where you know standardization is important, I guess, and that uh, while uh, they can complement our efforts to address mental health challenges that uh, we, uh, that that uh, it must be a complementary approach as opposed to you know uh, doing uh, singularly but doctor uh, very, on that very same note then uh, for example in so many countries around the world you see uh, similar problems that we have which is for uh, lack of human resource so they resort to leveraging technology as well so we talked about leveraging cultural practices but they to leverage technology as well so for example remote consulting uh you know with with uh, with psychiatrists so uh do you think that just like how our cultural practices can complement that do you think technology can also be used or are, are there barriers of of contextualization of of psychiatrists around the world not understanding the Bhutanese context if you could briefly highlight on that okay now uh uh, frankly speaking, sometimes I feel that uh, in order to be a very uh, uh, productive or very, very helpful psychiatrist, if it is from within the country or from within the culture, it is much better. So suppose if, if we connect to somebody uh, uh, who has no knowledge about the culture of Bhutan, um, I don't think it will work because we have different belief system. We have uh, like there are patient, patients who have seen ghosts, there are people who think that they are possessed, there are people who think. So suddenly the Western diagnosis does not match the presentation of the patients that uh, present to us. So yes. since we belong to the same culture, we understand that. And we sometimes even uh, encourage them to go for spiritual healing or uh, shamanism or whatever, uh, if, if that helps. So uh, suddenly if... Uh, uh, somebody who saw a ghost, for example, uh, some years ago, there was an outbreak of uh, a condition in one of the schools where every child was seeing a ghost when they went to the toilet. And it, yes. it became so, so rampant that the school had to be closed. And then some lums had to be called in. They had, they had to do a big, uh, uh, whatever you call that, uh, they, they perform some... Uh, Rituals in the night windows, where they throw windows. stones. Yeah, uh, so they they drove away all the evil spirits from that location, and after that things just calmed down. Now we didn't even have to medicate any of these children. See, Plus, that was a simple, simple, uh, simple therapy, but it was a very complete therapy which helped not only one individual but the entire school, and the school again Plus, started running smoothly thereafter. So. 
uh, what can we do like technology if you since you mentioned about it are we using any technology of course right now the the, the quickest technology obviously your telephone call so whenever there are doctors in the districts who stumble upon the diagnosis or who don't know how to handle a case they do call us we provide guidance through telephone calls uh, sometimes we also make it a point to have a video chat with the patient uh, himself or herself so that we can provide some sort of a guidance to the doctor there and if the medicines are available if a counselor is there they don't have to travel all the way to thimphu to to get whatever help is necessary for their mental health problem Lesla, plus doctor, thank you for a uh, very elaborate answer. Now, uh, Yishe, uh, as a young uh, professional passionate about well-being, I just want to pick your brains to know, uh, you know, you can share your personal anecdotes as well. Like, how do you maintain a healthy work-life balance, you know, between yourself and within your family as well, if you could elaborate on um, that? So... I believe, uh, like I mentioned before, you're human beings, so it's very difficult for one to be able to separate work life and personal life, which takes quite some time, actually. Um, but what I figured out and what, what people have mentioned to me, especially my friends, and what they do is they kind of do some sort of where when they're at work, they focus just on work. They try not to think of personal stuff. They try not to think of doing anything during work time they just focus what they can on work and after the uh, after the work is done they come home and then they spend time with their families um i know two three people who have two phones one is just for office one is for personal so that personal phone when they go to off uh, when they go to work is just off and when they come home the office uh, the office phone they have is usually turned off and they don't think about it until unless of course there's an emergency which usually happens once in a while but I think one of the most important thing when you're balancing your work and personal life is, of course, maintaining a lifestyle that suits you. My lifestyle that yes. I think is right will not be right for someone else. We all have different things. You need to try out different ways just to see what works for you, what not doesn't work for you. Um, but for yes. me personally, I think it's coming home, spending time with my family, just, you know, sitting down, having, grabbing, a, uh, even if my whole family is working, we try to meet for dinner, just talk about how everything is, going for walks when you can, planning a lunch once in a while with your friends, um, going for hikes, going for treks. And uh, when you're at work, just do your work on time, finish any outcomes you need, any projects you have, um, discuss with your colleagues what you're going through, talking about it. Um, just talking about anything. How was your day? Uh, oh, we have this project. What do you think about it? You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the sense that, oh, when you're at work, we want to not talk about anything else. We can talk about life. You can talk about how everything was. You just Plus. maybe not cross a boundary if you're not comfortable with it. Uh, people have different methods and ways to balance your work life. And like I mentioned, um, each person will be different. And as a professional that I just joined three years ago, I think for, for now, I'm actually having a good work-life balance. And I'm very proud to say that my institution has been very well in the sense trying to maintain that as well. Because what they say is that, oh, if you have work, you know, you can do it from home if you're not, but you can come home and do it. I mean, you can come to work and do it as well. And in that Plus. sense, I feel like uh, a lot of professionals when they join, especially now after COVID and with the, a lot of people leaving for Australia is, they don't know how to balance that because their friends Plus. have left, uh, their mentors have left. Um, their, yes. their directors, their, you know, people who are mentoring them have left. So they don't know how to handle it because all the work is in their hands. So in that yes. sense, I feel like the best thing they can do personally is I always recommended this. And I think um, it's one of my personal pet peeves in the sense that to always have a psychologist, if you can, if you can, uh, if you have one, but maintain a healthy relationship. That's the best way I can put it is have someone you can, someone close to you can talk to about how you feel because um, your friends may be the person who's helpful. Uh, even if you don't have friends and families who are very um, loving and kind, you always have yes. someone who's willing to listen to you. And I feel yes. like as human beings in the young workplace, you when you're getting to know the place, when you're getting to know into the work, it's always better to ask for advice. So yes. I think uh, that's maintaining yes. is like, you know, you try to find out what, what works best for you. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Yishe. So, uh, I mean, if you if you look at it, right, uh, many of our viewers might be listening to us and thinking perhaps burnout is all about mindset, all about how we approach work. And uh, are we correct to think that perhaps it's not external factors, right, uh, that are affecting you, but instead the way you approach, uh, your, you know, your work 
is 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 it is it uh, uh, does it make sense, doctor? Like uh, you know, uh, perhaps you're you're experiencing burnout, you're experiencing work-related stress, mm -hmm. not because the work is stressful, but because of the way you approach it. How much truth is there? There in that, uh, I think I think there is this is very very much true, because if you look at the causes and of mental disorders, there are three important factors that we consider. One is the yes biological model where we we believe that a, pe a person is born with a gene uh, the, it is inherited uh, and there can be some chemical imbalances in the brain which causes a person to uh, to have more stress or more uh, anxiety in comparison to and the person the other one is obviously the psychological factor where as we as uh, Yishe mentioned like uh, how how we take things like sometimes, yes. see, if we don't enjoy and enjoy the work we do, enjoy the profession we work, if we don't uh, do that, then obviously your psychology uh, is affected. So that's, that's what is called the psychological factor. And we also have the environmental factor. That is the factor that most of us always think that it could be the environment or the, or the situation that is actually stressful. So it is all how we take it and how our body is made to respond to that. That's why different people have different psychological uh, mechanisms to cope with stress. Some people really uh, can crash. Some people are very uh, strong and resilient they, and they can Plus, manage stress well. So it all depends on that. Lastly, doctor. So, um... Uh, uh, and, and this is for doctor for you as well. Like, uh, you know, how how can employers, right, la, who understand that the mental well-being of their employees is very important, but at the same time want to avoid situations like quite quitting, want to avoid situations where the work is not stressful, but you know the 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 employee or the team member is actually uh, you know going through a burnout, like. How can employers then create a culture of, how can organizations create a culture of openness and support around mental health at work? La? And maybe she can begin and then doctor can uh, uh, add. La. Sure. Um, so I think the first thing uh, any institution can do when they want to have um, proper well-being of any employee is mainly the process of being open talking about mental health, talking about stress, talking about workload, being open with your being open with your boss basically telling them oh you know this is my work i'm being overworked maybe talk about it and then i feel like if uh, which is a dream of course <laughs> is to have maybe a psychologist or maybe having a, like how we have counselors in school is having maybe a psychologist in every district maybe in the office if possible because when you have yes. someone to talk to about it and then being open and being open about oh if i'm suffering from depression if i'm suffering from anxiety being open about it uh, not hiding behind walls and pretending to not care about it, you know, because um, as doctor has mentioned, uh, and I think I also believe that the younger generation now are very open about their mental health. It's the old generation yes. who are very skeptical about how they view mental health, because um, if I can say it in Zonka is Simgi uh, Neji. So everyone, if you tell your grandparents or anyone is if I say, oh, I'm not feeling the best, you know, um, I just don't feel right. Uh, it's OK, you know, it's you can you can go through it. But the institutions, I believe the best thing they can do is provide an <laughs> pro, uh, awareness program, have meetings once in a while, go for talks, um, have situations where they ask the employees, what are your feelings? You know, what do you want to talk about? Is everything yes. okay? Do you, is the workload enough for you? Do you want me to, uh, do you want me to multitask it to someone else? Uh, the institutions in this sense can do that. But of course, there are other yes. ways to look into it. Um, but I think that's one of the best ways is to just be uh, have awareness programs and be open about it. And of course, have a psychologist Lesla. if possible. <laughs> Lesla. Lesla. Doctor, do you have anything to add on that? Or uh, I think uh, it was well covered. So I guess that is how it is. Uh, and as a, so... as, as a supervisor, we must also give that room because many times Lesla. people are so scared of the supervisors that they can't approach. So one has to yeah. be approachable so that that sense of uh, uh, comfort has to be built among yes. the boss and the subordinates. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Yes, doctor. So, but then I have a question for you, which is uh, now that we have established that, you know, the work-related stress is very much real and that it can have devastating consequences in the form of burnout, what are some of the signs and symptoms of mental health challenges at work 
that we can be aware of like how do i know my coworker is not well okay uh, that's a very uh, very interesting questions i think we are also coming towards the end of our talk i don't know how long is the talk by the way uh, no, please please take your time i think we can extend the extend okay we can ask, bit, extend. Like, yes. no yes, yes. no problem okay yes, so basically see uh, as we already discussed i think not everybody will go through the same type of presentation some people present differently some people present in a peculiar manner so the physical yes. symptoms obviously if you if you if you keep on hearing complaint from a colleague or your subordinate about constant headaches fatigue muscle tension <clears throat> some frequent digestive yes. problems difficulty in sleeping uh, and not eating well uh, this is these are the physical symptoms and when it comes yes. to the uh, emotional symptoms you can see them they are very irritable they are anxious uh, there are mood swings sometimes they are very erratic in their behavior they can be seen to be very restless and they seem to be feeling overwhelmed and yes. when it comes to the behavioral part uh, you can see uh, them uh, pro procrastinating they can have very poor performance slowly their performance like they may be very good uh, staff but suddenly you see them not performing as uh good as they used to uh, and you might see them uh, becoming absent from their work uh, or they are very tardy in their uh, activities uh, there may be increased use of alcohol or drug uh, they may yes. withdraw socially they are not mixing up with friends sometimes you, know, you suddenly observe that this person was very outgoing used to come make jokes and all suddenly is not doing that so we must be aware of that and then yes. when when they have that they also have difficulty concentration concentrating so these are called cognitive symptoms where they become forgetful yes. they are not able to make a decision properly and then because of all these they can have interpersonal conflict with the colleagues they can have de decreased empathy and they will not be able to communicate with their coworkers as well as they used to do in the past so these are some of the symptoms that we must look for and we must yes. provide uh we must provide that uh, uh you must provide that opportunity for them to express that they're going through this so that you know, we recognize that problem and maybe after that we can uh, recommend what sort of a treatment is required or maybe you you should also recommend them that they take leave to ex ac access uh, uh, professional services Let's talk to. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think you sort of answered my uh, uh, follow-up question, which was going to be: uh, once we notice these symptoms, what can we do to help them? And uh, you are uh, you you touched upon it as well. Now uh, I wanted to bring to our attention for the panelists and the viewers as well a very interesting legislation in France, right? Where uh, mm -hmm. employees are given the right to turn off from work-related digital communications after working hours. you know it's called the right to disconnect and what are your opinions on that you know and for for a country where you know where we are, we recognize that mental health is a important aspect of overall well being and we know the challenges uh, but then at the same time we do not have a overarching legislation uh, it seems uh, france has one which you know at least a form of it with the right to disconnect now what are your opinions on that and should putinese employees also you know have a right to disconnect as well and maybe you can begin with ishe doctor and then get get to you and i i believe you'll have two sets of opinions because uh you know what do you think about that really yes um so i think that's um we are a little too early in my opinion to go to that reach where you know you right to disconnect of course uh if the government right now with everything happening i feel like that would be a really great initiative of course uh to be able to that actually separates work life you know that separates your personal life your work life and it's a really good initiative and uh as far as i uh, to the best of my knowledge of course is the scandinavian countries have a 3 to 4 work week where they have three uh, three weekends So in that sense, of course, uh, Bhutan can stop initiating a process where you know you don't work after certain hours or you work certain hours, 
or you just don't necessarily need to come to work from nine to five without doing anything. You can actually do some sort of projects, give it to your boss, give it to your supervisor, have them return it back to you. And if you're done, you can go home, even if it's up to two, three p.m. So I think it's a really good initiative if we can have it in Bhutan, of course. But um, with the uh, what we need to look at into is the government resources, of course, first thing. Yes. We need to look into the opinions of the people working in such areas because um, such a drastic change will take, a, I don't think is would be welcomed at, such a, at a drastic change, of course. But I think the best thing we can do is slowly introduce the idea, see what the values and uh, opinions of each employees are. Because from there, I think that might actually help. But such a bill introduced suddenly would, would would take time, of course, and of course, the France when they opened it firstly, it was a slow process where it was introduced to the employees, in, introduced to institutions, and then how it then that's how it came about. So I think if you if Bhutan does accept such things, it would be a good way to help the employees. But uh, I think the values and opinions of everyone who are working and of course uh, employees are really really important at, at the end of the day. And doctor, what as a as a practicing psychiatrist, like what's your opinion on that? And also as an as a professional working professional yourself, like uh, what do you think about the right to disconnect? Uh, I wish we had that opportunity, plus, plus. Uh, but it is not happening, and it will perhaps not happen at least during my. Uh, uh, is like when I'm still working. I don't think that will happen That's because not. I have to, I have to keep my phone open in order to provide uh, consultation to different people from the districts, because uh, emergencies That's... can happen anytime. So as medical doctors, sometimes you are almost you know, on call every day. But of course, we have now divided our time so that uh, uh, if I'm not on call, there is somebody else on call. Uh, but the problem is sometimes uh, there is a preference over um, consultation also. So we don't have uh, a spoken rule that you cannot call any anyone. So we don't have that. Now, if you look at the civil service rule, uh, it says that a civil servant is on duty 24 hours. I don't know whether you have read that clause, but it is. Yes. And we are supposed to be available anytime, anywhere, if we are called for any type of uh, responsibility or some job. So, which means that um, I, I don't think we have that right to disconnect unless you take Less. a leave and go away. <laughs> last little doctor, <laughs> last, last doctor. I mean, uh, uh, we have stretched past the time limit. So we let's open up. Let's, I think many of our, uh, we have some questions uh, from our online viewers. So mm -hmm. um, let me just randomly select one. Uh, there's, I think this here's a question, and I think it's perhaps from a politician himself. Yeah, the question is, what? And I think perhaps, doctor, you you have, you can you, uh, try to tackle the question. What types of specific burnout or uh, you know work-related uh, stress or trauma do politicians face? Now? Is there a very specific burnout that politicians might face? And any types tips to manage them? Now? So if you could, if if you had a politician coming to you as a uh, as a patient okay. if you yeah. mm. now now frankly speaking i don't think there is there is really any specific type of burnout That's... but obviously the burnout a politician faces is much different than the burnout that an employee of an organization or the government agency has because a politician as a pol politician uh, they are they have a lot of responsibilities. They have to keep up to the uh, the party's uh, uh, manifesto. They have to provide uh, linkages with the uh, with the people back home from their own constituencies. Because I have seen that some politici politicians go to the extent of being usurer of the patients to the hospital also, which is, I guess, uh, uh, it is too much actually. Uh, Sometimes, in order to attract vote or uh, to 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 be appreciated as a politician, sometimes people go to the extent of uh, doing all these small, small, nitty gritty things. Because uh, yes. I think they should just uh, do away with that. Their responsibility is more towards nation nation building rather than doing all these small, small, nitty gritty thing, uh, putting a mobile voucher to somebody or. Uh, when somebody comes, host them at their house for dinner or whatever. I I don't think we 
if if uh, I were to be a politician, I would definitely lock, not like to do because that is uh, that is too stressful. The other thing that uh, thing is sometimes some decisions have to be made, hard decisions have to be made, and that brings a lot of criticism. And when the criticism comes, uh, we worry. I mean, there may be uh, times when people have sleepless, sleepless mm. night as politicians. So uh, specifically, I can't say because, uh, frankly speaking, no politician has come and sought any type of help with me so far. Uh, but yes, nonetheless, but... Uh, nonetheless, I can just give uh, what, what can you do? That's why I've already mentioned, like, uh, first of all, there has to be a work balance. I think Ishe put it so nicely, how you can balance your professional life from your own personal life. I think it is very important. And we must promote some sort of relaxation, such as any type of hobby, uh, exercise, uh, cutting away from all the uh, social media so that you are not bugged every time. Uh, and then uh, uh, they should also have some sort of a uh, recreational activities, they can have uh, relaxation activities, all these things. I think uh, basically how we manage stress is very Plus. similar to how we manage work stress. Sleeping in time, eating in time, drinking well, relaxation, meditation, going for a walk, going for a hiking, exploring your hobby, all these things are some of the important things that actually help us to do that. But specifically for politicians, as I mentioned, I think we must focus on, on the higher responsibility than on the small nitty gritty things so that they feel more comfortable. Last, uh, last thank you, Dr. Dishi, do you have anything to add uh, on, on this or has Dr. covered uh, everything? <laughs> actually, doctors, uh, doctors covered it more. I think he, he, he's better one at this. <laughs> Less, less. So uh, now, uh, because we've really stretched past our time limit, now uh, I have a question, though, which is, uh, what is your parting message about improving the mental well-being of employees in the workplace? Any suggestions you haven't shared already or a message that you'd like to stress again? And we could begin with Tishe and then end with Dr. La. Um, so far for me, I think uh, it was addressed by Her Majesty in the closing, or the, I think it was one of the closing remarks by Her Majesty for the opening nice. of FEMA Center. And she mentions that the, uh, we can overcome any challenge if we work together as a community. And of course, when we talk about it, when, we, when everyone at home talks about it, it's an open thing. The stigmatization is already there. But I think the Pema Center is working towards that to destigmatize the uh, to destigmatize that um, mental health is not just something we need to hush about; it's openly talk about. And I think the best thing I can actually support is um, and say that is my dream or <laughs> my opinion to the government is to have many trained world psychologists and um, psychiatrists in the country. I think that's really important because it your. It, the, when you think about burnout, it's not just the employees that's affected, like I mentioned, it's also the family members, it's your children, it's your parents, it's your siblings, those are affected at the end of the day. And for me, if the children are affected, then as His Majesty has always mentioned, the children are the future of the nation. If the children go through abuse, if the children is neglected, if they're abused, uh, if they don't get the attention they need, if they don't get the love they receive at a young age, they will seek it out elsewhere, where drug abuse problems come yes. out, where again, unemployment issues come out, and they will look for attention elsewhere. And I think that's really important is the, the need to have proper psychologists, maybe, and psychiatrists in the country. So these issues that are at work can be left at work, and when they come home, the children and the family and the spouses are happy, and that's how the country can grow as a nation. Lesla. Thank, thank you, Ishe. Uh, doctor, the floor is yours. I think uh, uh, we have covered fairly well. Almost every everything was done. I mean, if we had the opportunity, we could go on and on. Uh, but the, <laughs> Let's talk uh, the, parting, the parting message uh, would be like, uh, it's just my wish. Huh? If some big, uh, big organizations uh, or corporate sectors or something, if they could uh, hire at least one counselor for their own organizations so that anybody who expresses any type of mental state could get immediate care. Plus, so that is one, one thing that all these big organizations can think of. Now we are producing at least six to 12 counselors every year. So this year we are taking 12, 
earlier we used to just have six. So there are a few, I mean, right now we have employed, I think government has employed everybody, but over the period of time, if there are uh, people who in the market who can be hired and uh, kept in the organization, I think that would be very helpful until we have a big workforce like uh, Yishe was talking about psychologist and all. So uh, if we begin with small thing, not, not big. So uh, it's like buying an alto instead of a Prado Jumbe. <laughs> yes, plus, so we, we could do that. Plus, plus, thank you, doctor. Uh, thank you, doctor. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Shea, for a very engaging discussion. Uh, we'd also like to extend our gratitude to all our viewers. Uh, before we end, uh, the founder of Loden Foundation, who used to uh, who, who used to host Bhutan Dialogues, he would always end. Uh, Dr. Kamfunso would always end with a. Uh, uh, a chetam or a, uh, or a, a, a quote, some kind of quote, uh, every Bhutan dialogue session. So I wanted to end with one as well. Uh, it goes, Jimpi Nani Cheki Jimba Chola. The best gift of knowledge, uh, the gift of knowledge is the best gift. Na. So the Bhutan dialogues uh, yeah, is in many ways a gift of knowledge from the Lodin Foundation. So if you want to view other Bhutan dialogues episode, you can visit our website, www.putardialogues.bt, and you can follow our social media handles as well. And you can also follow the social media handles of the Loden Foundation and stay abreast with the incredible work uh, that Loden Foundation does. With that, Kadin uh, thank you so much for, for this very engaging discussion. We hope to see you next month for the, uh, with uh, another uh, interesting topic. Thank you.